everyone. Welcome to Habitat for Humanity International's Europe Housing Forum. I'm Dean Nelson. I'm a journalist focused on international affairs, a founder of Foreign Desk, media advisors who've worked with Habitat for Humanity International for a few years now. And I'm going to be your master of ceremonies for what is a very special event, our first Europe Housing Forum. Oh, we can't hear me. Hang on. Can we hear me now? <laughs> Hello, can we hear me now? Ap apologies, if you can hear me, apologies for this um, uh, this sort of faltering start. But uh, OK, I, th I believe you can hear me now <laughs> and I shall, I shall start again. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Habitat for Humanity Internationals. Um, Europe Housing Forum. I'm Dean Nelson. I'm a journalist focused on international affairs, founder of Foreign Desk, media advisors uh, who've been working with Habitat for Humanity International for a few years now. And I'm going to be your master of ceremonies for what is a very special event, our first Europe Housing Forum since the COVID-19 pandemic changed our world beyond recognition and challenged all of us in ways we could never have imagined. For 45 years, Habitat for Humanity International has been bringing people together to build homes, communities and hope. Now it's working and collaborating in more than 70 countries around the world and has helped more than 35 million people build and protect their homes. Today, that work and collaboration is more vital than ever. So over the next four days, we're going to hear from some incredible speakers from throughout the global housing sector and explore together how we can make decent, affordable housing solutions a catalyst for sustainable cities and economic growth in the face of the great challenges of our time. Pandemic, climate change, poverty, exclusion and migration. How do we build back fairer and better to meet the changing need? How will we build the foundations for the future of affordable housing? We'll hear about the increasing role technology can and will play in finding new solutions and how the public and private sectors can work together, not just to meet the need, but also to make sustainable housing a driver of economic growth and inclusion. We're incredibly honoured that so many of you, more than a thousand registered participants, have been able to join us for these vital discussions. From our supporters and sponsors, the Hilti Foundation, Wiener Berger, the Somfy Foundation and Whirlpool, to our very esteemed speakers, including members of the European Parliament, city mayors, senior officials and ministers from around the world, academics, campaigners, NGO leaders and policymakers. And I want to stress to you all that this is a discussion forum. It's not a stand and delivery event. Everyone joining us this week can have their say. Once you've registered on the Deal Room platform, you can pose questions via the chat function at any time during our sessions. You can schedule one-to-one -one meetings with other participants or chat via Messenger. You can also book private meetings through the platform. Text and video instructions on how you can find and contact fellow attendees and participants and make your views heard are in the announcements section in the Deal Room lobby. You can all add your sessions to your own personal calendars too. But can I also stress that you need to click to join each session when it's live. It won't happen automatically. So regardless of whether you'll be speaking at one of the events, you can make your voice heard and through the Deal Room platform, you have an Access All Areas Pass. Can I also urge you all to click on the Expo tab in the lobby to check out the virtual stands presented by our sponsors and valued ex exhibitors and co-organisers. And I'd like to name here our co-organisers. Initiative Wohnungswirtschaft Osteuropa, Housing Initiative for Eastern Europe, Institute for Housing and Urban Development Studies at Erasmus University in Rotterdam, Global Advocacy Campaign for the Habitat for Humanity International, USAID, Cities Alliance, Cities Without Slums, CRS, Catholic Relief Services, the City of Vienna, the European Investment Bank, FIANSA, the European Federation of National Organisations working with the homeless, Housing Europe, Canal Insulation, UN Habitat, the International Union of Tenants and UNECE, the United Nations Economic Commission for Europe. A heartfelt thanks to you all for your support in shaping the sessions we'll all be part of over these next few days, helping us to prioritise topics, bringing the wonderful speakers we're going to hear from and to shape this forum. Thank you very much to you all. 
In addition to our two uh, to our main forum sessions, I want to draw your attention to two side events today at 2.15 for two days. We'll also have the residential energy efficiency for low income households event. And on Friday morning from 9 to 11.15 a.m., there's the Polish Housing Forum 2021. You can access both events by clicking all events on the left hand column in the deal room lobby. On Friday, our final day, we'll be joining our colleagues in Warsaw for a live presentation of three awards for excellence in housing innovation and the fight for better housing provision for all. So please do stay with us and join our winners to hear their inspiring stories of hope. And that is what this forum is all about, weighing the scale of the challenge of a new threat and finding hope in the ingenious policy, finance and technology responses to it. Now, I'd like to say out how honoured I am personally to be a part of this forum and why all of these themes we'll be discussing mean so much to me. My earliest memories are of living in a slum in the docks area of East London, a Victorian terraced house deemed unfit for human habitation. It was in the 1960s. Many of the men in our street at any given time were in jail and crime was rife. My bedroom had a bucket to catch water, which came through the roof when it rained. The house had no central heating or hot running water, no bathroom or indoor, indoor toilet. The toilet was in the backyard where a bath hung on the wall. Once a week on Sundays, my dad would get it down, clean out the spiders and fill it with water boiled in four pans on the scullery stove. It was cold, damp and mouse infested. When I was eight, we were rehoused to a modern council or social housing estate on the outskirts of London with central heating, an indoor bathroom and toilet, a small garden, a waterproof roof and my own bedroom. It was a fresh start for our family, a new world of possibilities to us all. And I believe to my core that without that fresh start, I wouldn't have gone to university, become a journalist, met my wife and had my kids. That move from slum to new council house changed my life. And I'm sure I wouldn't be here with all of you today had we not been given a decent home. Now, that was almost 50 years ago. And lucky though we were, it breaks my heart and challenges us all that millions of people around the world still suffer today for want of that same provision and fresh start. So I really am very honoured to be a part of this Europe Housing Forum and the discussions we'll have over the next four days on the best and most innovative ways in which we can meet our greatest need a safe and healthy home for all. We're going to begin this session with our four opening addresses from four very important speakers. First, Habitat for Humanity International's Chief Executive Officer, Jonathan Reckford, followed by Rick Hathaway, Habitat for, Habitat's Vice President for Europe, Middle East and Africa. We'll then hear addresses from Her Royal Highness Princess Lamia bin Majid Saud Al Saud, Secretary General and Trustee of Al Walid Philanthropies. And winding up the welcome, Memuna Sharif, Director of UN's uh, sorry, UN Habitat. Leading, leading us in is Habitat's Jonathan Reckford. Over to you, Jonathan. Thank you. We have spent a lot of the last couple of years waiting and wondering. The time has come for key decision makers and stakeholders in the housing industry to cooperate in building a viable future for all. Through this forum, we want to bring together housing sector players to collaborate and learn from one another. We will also showcase and reward initiatives that contribute to affordable housing solutions. Then, when the meetings are over, we must bring the issue of decent and affordable housing to the forefront of conversations throughout Europe. Europe is experiencing an escalating housing crisis, just like the rest of the world. In addition, Estimates are that more than 50 million households in the European Union, that's about 10%, are experiencing energy poverty. Unable to afford renovations on their old and poorly built housing, families are forced to sacrifice essentials such as food and medicine to pay their energy bills. And COVID-19 made an already desperate housing situation so much worse. Sheltering in place was not a solution for vulnerable families who did not have a healthy place to go home to. Many families did not experience the same feelings of security as those who could work from home in relatively comfortable surroundings. Recommendations to practice social distancing and good hygiene were difficult or impossible for many who had to work outside the home to provide for their families. Handwashing guidelines suddenly caused many people around the world to imagine what it would be like not having access to clean water. 
they began to think about what it might be like to live in overcrowded rooms with leaks, pests, poor ventilation and insulation. The lockdown directives also shined a light on disparities in health care and access to resources. Barriers such as lack of secure land tenure and problems of accessing credit also continue to impact families living in difficult conditions. Finding affordable housing solutions will continue to be an important factor in the recovering economy. This will present both challenges and opportunities. Housing is a capital intensive sector and without government action the availability of private capital is likely to decrease. We hope that governments will develop and implement support measures. Lower income, informal workers make up a substantial share of service workers engaging in face-to-face -face professional activities. They have been particularly hard hit by the restrictions put in place in response to the pandemic. The resulting job and income losses for households with a limited safety net have been catastrophic for many. Habitat for Humanity believes that addressing the housing shortage can be critical in recovering from the economic disaster brought on by the health crisis. The construction sector creates many jobs and can help rebuild emerging market economies. Research done for the Cornerstone Recovery Report, commissioned by Habitat, found that housing is a larger than expected contributor to gross domestic product. Analysis was done among 11 low- and middle-income countries. When considering often overlooked components of the housing market, such as the incremental building that prevails in the informal sector, researchers found that housing accounts for up to 16.1 percent of the GDP. That places housing on par with sectors such as manufacturing that often draw far more attention in economic recovery plans. Yet, at the same time the report was issued last year, only 22 of 196 countries explicitly included housing components in their pandemic recovery proposals. Since then, Habitat's Terwilliger Center for Innovation and Shelter has convened a coalition to work with governments to include housing in COVID-19 economic recovery planning. The pandemic also has inadvertently created an impetus for governments to review housing guidelines Policies that stimulate construction of new and improved housing can generate significant employment opportunities, particularly for the part of the workforce with low levels of formal education. As we look forward, we hope that post-pandemic rebuilding will be people-centered. We want to focus on the human aspect of housing rather than on housing solely as an economic product. Working together, civil society and non-governmental actors can make sure that the vulnerable groups and the informal sector are included in the conversation and are not left behind. They can also make sure local residents are involved in the decision-making process. In Europe, national governments can make use of funding from the European Union budget through programs such as the EU Green Deal and the Recovery Plan that focus on renovating and improving energy efficiency of residential houses. During this conference, you will hear more about how to tap into these programs and how they can contribute to climate change actions. We are excited about investments that can produce long-term positive impacts for households, improve energy efficiency, and provide increased resilience in the face of natural disasters. We want to see more success stories, like the partnership between USAID and Habitat which refurbished 62 apartment buildings in North Macedonia. The project increased energy efficiency and the affordability of houses. In one of the buildings, residents took out loans to replace all the windows, which reduced heating bills by at least 30 percent. Getting all of the residents of huge apartment buildings to agree on a plan was a major endeavor, but it created a stronger community as they worked together to find solutions. We also want to call on governments to promote a policy of infrastructure improvements to address basic services such as safe drinking water, drainage, and sanitation to foster community health. 
all of us must commit to a forward-looking posture and begin putting into action the strategies we've had plenty of time to develop and examine. We are stronger together. So my question is this, how can those of us gathered for this forum work together toward the shared goals that many of us seek? What steps can we take to build upon the knowledge and successes of each other so that we can draw nearer to a world where everyone has a decent place in which to live? My prayer is that this time next year, we will be celebrating a healthier world and more families and communities made stronger by holistic housing improvements. Thank you. Juan. Thank you, Jonathan, for your remarks on the importance of housing in the life of a family and the well being of a community, and for challenging us to work together to put into action the strategies we've developed to draw nearer to a world where everyone has a decent place to live. Greetings from Brussels and welcome to the 2021 Europe Housing Forum. My name is Rick Hathaway, Area Vice President of Europe, Middle East and Africa for Habitat for Humanity International. We're pleased to partner with you over these next four days in sharing best practices, knowledge, experience and forging new opportunities for deliver delivering shelter effectively across Europe and beyond. Over the next four afternoons, we'll gather online to hear from influential policymakers from the European Parliament, city representatives of Budapest, Bratislava, Vienna, and Paris, urban planners, developers, researchers, development agencies, corporate partners, and colleagues in civil society. They will share their knowledge and experience in housing and discuss potential solutions to complex housing challenges. This conference is following the important climate change discussions in Glasgow at COP26, where world leaders were providing commitments to address the worsening climate situation. In Europe at the moment, we are witnessing a worsening economic and health conditions related to another COVID-19 spike. The situation looks bleak. And for those living in inadequate housing, their daily lives are even more challenging, impacting the hope of the next generation. The good news is that there are solutions. These solutions can often tackle the affordable housing, economic, the health and the climate crisis at the same time. The experience, resources, influence and energy gathered online for the next four days is indeed impressive. And when connected together and aligned can achieve great things and address these very issues. At Habitat for Humanity, we believe that the climate and the global housing crisis are inextricably linked. Addressing the housing shortage sits at the heart of solutions to the greatest challenges facing Europe and the entire world today. The importance of housing as a driver of economic growth and sustainability in human settlements will be one of the central discussions during the European Housing Forum this week. We'll look at new European initiatives, the European Green Deal and the new European Bauhaus, as well as discuss global housing issues and innovative solutions that can significantly contribute to reducing the global housing deficit and providing decent shelter for the most vulnerable families. At the end of these four days, we want to identify and promote new inclusive, affordable, sustainable and equitable, equitable housing initiatives with our collective energy and our collective commitment. The time has come for key decision makers and stakeholders in the housing industry to come together and collaborate to build a sustainable future for all and to bring the issue of housing to the forefront of the global and the European agenda. The 2021 Europe Housing Forum is our collective step in this direction, and we all are a part of that. I want to welcome here our European partners, like-minded organizations and coalitions that have long been present in the region and advocated for the cause of affordable and sustainable housing. Our partners have worked with us over the last few months to develop the program for these four afternoons. We also have invited esteemed speakers to discuss global urban challenges. We live in a world where 3 billion people are expected to need adequate housing by 2030. It's critical that we align our resources, knowledge and energy towards a world where everyone has a decent place to live. Shortly, you'll hear a special address from Ms. Mamana Mocharif, Executive Director of UN Habitat, the United Nations agency dedicated to the issues of human settlements and a key partner of Habitat for Humanity and all of us assembled here. 
But first, we're fortunate to have a message to the European Housing Forum from Her Royal Highness Princess Lamia bint Majid Al Saud, General Secretary of Al Walid Philanthropies. Thank you again for joining the 2021 Europe Housing Forum. We look forward to working with you over the next four days and forging new opportunities to collaborate and create greater shelter impact in the years to come. Thank you. I would like to take this opportunity to thank you all for attending this event, both in person and virtually. Access to housing is a critical challenge that is facing the world today. It is also a challenge facing our future generation, yet it respects no borders, both developed and developing nations must respond to growing demands to provide safe homes for the populations. These challenges have grown tenfold recently because of the COVID-19 pandemic impacting households in an unprecedented way. Across the Middle East, millions of people are living in unsuitable or overcrowded homes, leaving families vulnerable against extreme weather conditions. As a Secretary General of Al Walid Philanthropies, a global philanthropic organization supporting over 1,000 projects around 189 countries, chaired by His Royal Highness Prince Al Walid bin Talal, I have seen firsthand what safe homes mean for the developing community we support. Collaborating with a range of educational, governmental, philanthropic, and housing organizations over the last 40 years, El Walid Philanthropies is proud of our history and importantly, our ever-growing ambition. Provide safe and quality housing to those that offer so much potential, yet are in need of the transformational change that a home can bring has been a key focus for us. Just last year, El Walid Philanthropies partnered with Habitat for Humanity to provide one million US dollars to aid recovery work in Albania. From the consequences of the 6.4 magnitude earthquake in November 2019, the program provides temporary shelter to the families who lost their homes and continues to help people to rebuild their livelihood after the damage still reaching around 400 Albanians directly. More widely, since 2012, El Walid Philanthropies has contributed significantly to Habitat for Humanity's disaster response and risk reduction, including during the floods in Sri Lanka, earthquakes in Ecuador, Japan and Nepal, and many other countries. Thanks to the joint effort of El Walid Philanthropies and Habitat for Humanity, more than 36,500 people have received assistance and managed to rebuild their lives. Finally, one of the main elements that our chairman believes in is the housing sector. That's why it falls under one of our main pillar, developing communities. I have had the privilege of leading life-changing initiatives across the globe. Safe housing can truly change people's life and we cannot stop now in our endeavors to provide this basic human right. Since the pandemic, has even further exposed the necessity of safe housing. It has also shown a light on how through the power of collaboration, communities around the world could come together and act. I wish to thank you all for your time today, and I look forward to us carrying on the spirit of collaboration across the world to reach our goal in providing safe housing for all. Excellencies, colleagues, friends, ladies and gentlemen, it is a pleasure to speak to you at this important gathering to collectively reimagine and build the new reality of housing and cities. At UN Habitat, we strongly believe that adequate housing is one of the transformative forces that can help cities to overcome challenges related to climate change, poverty, exclusion, and inequality. It can encourage cities to embark on a path to plan inclusive and sustainable urbanization. The COVID-19 crisis has contributed to highlight and reinforce the importance of this task. As noted in our flagship report, 
cities and pandemics towards a more just, green and healthy future. COVID-19 has made even clearer the necessity to address the pre-existing housing crisis, a crisis reflected in the increasing unaffordability of adequate housing to a larger share of the urban population. We strongly believe that tackling challenges from the COVID-19 pandemic, climate and housing emergencies will require a new social contract based on access to adequate housing for all and on governmental interventions to respect, protect and fulfil this fundamental right. As clearly laid out by the Housing 2030 study launched last month by UN Habitat together with the UN Economic Commission for Europe, UNECE and Housing Europe to achieve change, governments need to coordinate policies purposefully by ensuring complementarity between objective, key stakeholder roles, resources and actions. Still, we also believe that achieving the right to adequate housing for all needs to be ultimately recognised as a shared responsibility with other stakeholders, civil society, private sector, academia and the donor community. In this framework, the regional housing forums can provide a critical space to foster more contact connectedness and collaboration among key stakeholders of the housing sector, leading to innovation and scale in affordable housing. Let me end by thanking Habitat for Humanity and all the panelists and participants who will contribute to this forum by sharing their knowledge, experiences and best practices. I wish you all a great, fruitful discussion. Thank you. And it's Princess Lamia bin Majid Saud Al Saud, Mamuna Sharif, Jonathan Rackford and Rick Hathaway for those powerful opening words to get us started. We're shortly going to take a five minute break to allow deal room to set the stage for our first opening plenary session, the global impact of COVID-19 on housing, the role of housing related public authorities during and after COVID-19. Now, lockdown responses to the pandemic confined us to our homes and forced us to confront their shortcomings. For those of us lucky enough to have homes, they found their most private spaces had become classrooms, workplaces, and in many cases, isolation wards too. Suddenly, there was no escaping cramped space, damp walls, leaky ceilings, poor insulation and rising fuel bills. How did our public authorities meet the challenge and what lessons can we learn to build back better? Stefan Wettstein, Research Fellow at University of Western Australia and a renowned expert on urban transformations and affordable housing, will be our moderator for the session. We'll be getting straight into that after this short break. But remember, you need to click on click to join this and every session uh, via all events in the deal room lobby. See you in five minutes.
I welcome you all back to our first plenary session here at the Europe at Europe's Housing Forum. The opening plenary is called the global impact of COVID-19 on housing, the role of housing related public authorities during and after COVID-19. My name is Dr. Steffen Wettstein. I'm a researcher and also an expert here at uh, urban development in Europe. And I'm very pleased to moderate this session with um, six uh, participants we are very proud of to, to have attracted to this, um, to this panel. Um, before we want to give the microphone to our panelists and have a nice, uh, interesting roundtable talk afterwards, um, I would like to take the chance and um, offer some introductory remarks. And for that, I have prepared some slides. And let's hope that technology will um, you know, work today, which I'm sure it will. So one second, and um, I will share some slides with you. We'll see the, the opening slide with the title of our plenary and also the name of the European Housing Forum, which is actually really important. So I, I want to say a couple of words about um, what what this whole uh, forum um, could be seen at. Um, we then I'm going to open up with some key questions um, that that may guide our thinking today and maybe also over the last couple of days, and and offer some some impulse. Then I want to have a quick talk about the pandemic disruptions and what COVID-19 has done um, based on the research work and the the um, also um, the institutional work I'm doing with uh, Jana Neverleinen as the um, joint coordinator um, research and policy at the European Network for Housing Research. And then I want to focus in on the public authorities and, and governments at all levels. And then really it's about the, the giving the microphone to our speakers. So if we, um, I, I thought about how do I, I start off um, the, the plenary so obviously, um, the, the first uh, point here is really important, that the quest for affordable and adequate housing for all in the middle of the global pandemic disruptions and also with the uh, associated widespread prosperity losses we experience has probably never been so important um, as, as now, um, arguably. And um, so the Europe Housing Forum is extremely timely and the title as well, because the focus on building foundations for the future of affordable housing is really a key theme we should all really think about and, and act on. Um, it invites certainly for an honest and productive dialogue and hopefully this plenary will open up this dialogue. The uh, opening plenary will discuss a particular aspect of this, this quite big topic and we'll look at the role of public authorities and other public institutions um, in the crisis and also beyond and also the measures and the policies that um, um, have been taken and should be taken. I, um, as I said, want to use five key trends that, that um, could be observed over the last, um, well, over the last decades, actually, um, before we look at the COVID-19 disruptions itself. So I think one trend that's really important is that we have seen a shift from housing for needs towards housing for wants in recent decades. And that comes especially since the 1990s with the decoupling of housing and labor markets and the rise of the affordability issue. We see the uh, reduction of social housing stocks and I come from Germany and Germany too has lost roughly half of its housing stock, uh, social housing stock in the last uh, 18 years. We see more issues around residential displacement and also a widespread reliance on informal housing solutions. So the question here could be reassessing our housing systems. How can we shift back to providing for people's basic needs, promote social spatial cohesion and fully deliver on housing as human right? because that's what it is. And you can see, I put in, in brackets here also, the reference points, why it is uh, actually enshrined as, as a human right. The second trend um, refers to the um, wider investment landscape. We could argue that recent decades have witnessed a shift away from productive investment and more towards speculative asset inflating investment. And, and that kind of shift has favored particular places and also particular constituency groups, the winners. Of, of those developments. Residential housing has right been at the central of this shift. So the question could be, how can housing construction 
modernization and also re-regulation become a stimulus engine for struggling economies? And how can retained housing affordability as development principle facilitate productive and innovative economic activities that benefit all? That could be called, um, uh, for example, a shared prosperity agenda for housing. Uh, a third entry point I want to provide um, with a view at um, finance. So recent decades have witnessed a shift away from in investment into affordable and social housing um, and towards uh, housing as a prime instrument for private wealth generation on one hand and private life risk mitigation like old age uh, um, provision, for example. So then question is, how can we repurpose housing finance and finance systems generally and strategically channel funds and resources into much needed and large scale affordable and socially equitable housing and renovation projects. Let's call this the inclusive resource allocation agenda for housing. Fourth entry point, recent decades have also witnessed a shift away and a bit, you have to be careful here, but we could say yes, shift away from biophysically healthy housing, although much housing stock that we have inherited is actually also in, 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 in not a healthy uh, condition, towards housing that has increases has increased overall its planetary footprint. It had, uh, has added to reduce biodiversity by sprawling cities and metropolises and often also promotes a longer urban commuting. Now decarbonizing housing stocks has moved up to the top of our societal to-do list. Question, how can our approach to existing and to new housing actively help planet and life world to recover? What is needed to cool down the earth and what is needed to rewild the earth? Here I go with David Attenborough's call. Um, while we care deeply for people and communities. So this connection is really important. You know, the so-called uh, Olive Agenda, I found an interesting quote on this, um, marrying both the planetary and, and, and the people needs. Fifth uh, question uh, concerns the division in societies. We all have noticed that over in, in recent uh, decades, in particular recent years also, we have seen um, a division in society that housing, in fact, has accelerated and cemented painful divisions within and across our societies between the housed and the unhoused people, but between housing system insiders and housing system outsiders, between buyers and renters, between urban and rural dwellers, between generations, and between also the global north and the global south. Question, how can positive housing outcomes unite again divided populations and unite split constituencies and nurture trust building? without compromising the dignity and self-responsibility of people in communities. So that could be a, a cohesion agenda. So with all those, um, I guess, quite um, fundamental uh, shifts and, and associated questions, we now can have a quick look at the uh, COVID-19 disruptions. Um, I'm not claiming that this is a, a full list here, but certainly you will you will uh, see some of those trends also um, um, mirrored in, in your own society, in your own city, where, where you where you are right now. So certainly the COVID-19 pandemic has highlighted very clearly the basic need function of housing. If we spend more time in our homes and have to do more there, we first of all have to have a home and we have to have an adequate home. So the issue of homelessness, the housing conditions, the basic housing related services, but also issues like physical and mental health to do with housing, access to amenities and infrastructure, and I mentioned before, the displacement risk, all have come more to the fore in recent uh, 18 months. We also see uh, two polarizing trends. On the one hand, we see domestic intensification. Families, households have more work to do at home, including education now for the kids, have to be a risk manager, more care work, and so on. On the other hand, we see many millions of households uh, suffering from domestic insulation, loneliness, isolation, truncated social networks. And I'm really uh, grateful here to um, Andres uh, rodriguez Posse, who has recently um, eloquently showed uh, data, especially, especially about this last trend, the insulation trend. It's a really worrying issue. So how then the question is, can we um, overcome those, those key issues? At the same time, we have witnessed runaway property prices. Many people would have expected that in times of economic downturn and uh, basically a social standstill, that property prices also would go down. But we actually see that in many cities, the other way is actually true. Um, further cheap money injection have um, added to the asset price rise. And we see at the moment also a price rent divergence at the moment and overall an affordability pressure increase. 
for those of you who are interested in the spatial in the spatial aspects, we see um, interesting, perhaps even interesting urban reconfiguration happening. Question about um, the end of urbanization. Um, recently, a great article from um, Professor Glaser about this question. The urbanization question mark, suburbia 2.0. The rise of satellite urbanism, people moving away from, from the city center, those who can afford it, I have to say. The rise of digital villages and so on. At the same time, we talk about mixed use inner cities, five 50 minute cities and also the use of hybrid spaces. And last but not least here, construction work and renovation work has overall decreased in recent times. You know, COVID-19 work restrictions have meant that that um, construction work has slowed down. Ireland is a really good example. It has uh, seriously slowed down there. But we also know, we all know that face a material crisis and a labor shortages. So how do we actually want to build, if that's possible at all, build out of crisis? So if you agree with uh, those, those points by large, then we also probably can say that we have a, a, a much bigger to-do list now for residential housing. Housing should do so many things. It, A, of course, is here as a basic human need to help us all to survive and to be social beings. It's also an ontological asset for households and families, it gives a sense of security, sense of being. It's now also a resource for, re for resilience and innovation. It should continue to be a life risk mitigator. It should also be a safer of planet and climate, it should be an economic stimulus tool. It should be a building block for vibrant communities and, and neighborhoods, and also a strategic development uh, tool for urban planning. So with this beefed up to-do list, uh, let's look at actually the state of public authorities and governments at all levels, who arguably are key drivers and key actors in, in those um, uh, new policy responses. Here, I put a bit of a, in the beginning, a bit of a, a, a list here that, 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 that reads a bit, bit um, um, uh, sad, really, when you think about it. We see in, in many ways state, uh, a faction of the state that are more in conflict with each other. So we see some central government versus local government um, politics, um, not just in Hungary, also in other cities, in other countries. We see um, quite uneven access to the European stimulus funds. So I think cities at the moment have to struggle very hard to get an equal share there. It's usually national uh, government uh, mediated and the Visegrad mayors have, for example, put this on the list. We also um, overall can say that we face the municipal squeeze. There's more work to do, but less money available because rates, and tax intake, but also a uh, transfer from central governments are not happening in the same way as before the pandemic. So overall, also, we have inherited uneven power relations. Public sector work is usually reliant on financial markets for resources, which makes it hard to do work that is not uh, immediately uh, you know, bankable and, and, and offers a return of investment. We also know that government steering often can contradict with private decision making and private resource allocation. But with saying this, we also see a lot of hope at the moment. The common good imaginary has come back and also emerging trajectories of, um, of, uh, around capacity building. The so-called Cornwell consensus and uh, Mariana Matsukato last week reminded us of that this in her, in her work. The Cornwell consensus may give us hope that this common good imaginary may be in, enshrined now in, in, in new policy settings. The Leipzig Carta has put in urban uh, development, has put the issue, the, the, the focus on, on the common good as well. The uh, Research and Resilience Facility puts a lot of money into, into European um, processes, funding processes, and also the human rights focus, housing for all, um, has become much more prominent in recent times. So with all of that, I, I really want to give now the, um, in a minute, the microphone to our speakers. Uh, the opening plenary will start off with some, some impulse presentations, um, around eight minutes per, per speaker. So we first in the presentations focus on the pandemic. So what was the key role there of the authorities and government on all levels in the pandemic? Which policies um, have you witnessed? And, and where do we see, um, I guess, success on one hand, but also gaps and failures in those policies? So this is what the presentations will be about. And the round table later will be an invitation to think ahead. This is about futures, about solutions. So what are some of the new roles for public authorities and government? and what needs to change, new ideas, new agendas. So this is the solution building um, part a bit later on. So uh, 10 minutes, um, I think I've taken up 10, um, and that means 50 minutes now for the presentations, 20 minutes roundtable, then your chance for question and answer. Please use the uh, chat, uh, chat function, and we try to 
as much as we can uh, use your your um, your input there and then some closing remarks. Our speakers today, we start off with Kim van Sparentag, member of the European Parliament, very vocal about housing and other social um, um, issues here at the European Parliament. We then have uh, Mayor Sanya Wilson, the mayor of Koboko in Uganda on board. Afterwards, Dori Zandoni, well-known expert on housing here in Europe, chair of the UNECE Committee for Urban Development, Housing, Land Management, and also is for many years involved uh, on, on a very high level on housing in Albania. Then my um, colleague uh, Jana Neverleinen from, this, uh, from Finland, uh, working as a senior ministerial advisor and minister for the environment, but also uh, she's joint coordinator for the, um, as I said, for the uh, research uh, working group, sorry, research and policy at the European Network of Housing Research. Stepan Ripka from Prague, housing advisor for the city of Prague, who, um, advising uh, the councillor on, on housing questions, social housing and other housing questions. And last but not least, Tobias Sebi, councillor for heritage and housing policies for the city of Rome. So that's me. Now it's time for the dialogue, time for the presentations. I um, will stop my screen share. And I will pass on the microphone to our first um, speaker, our first panelist, and that should be Kim Sparantag. Kim, can you hear me? Um, yes, um, and thank you for the invitation to speak at this uh, in very interesting panel today. When we're talking about the question of, you know, the impact of COVID uh, on housing, I think the main thing we have seen in the pandemic is how important a safe, healthy and comfortable home really is. People were asked to shelter in place and to work from home. And the pandemic has in the first place put a spotlight on the housing crisis in Europe. Well, because from Warsaw to Athens and Dublin to Lisbon, more and more people simply can't afford a decent home anymore. Throughout the EU, housing prices have risen 7% in the last year. And in my own country, the Netherlands, housing prices even went up with 16%. And this while people have very often seen their income drop. In particular, people on flexible and precarious contracts have suffered. And for them, owning their own house is often just a utopian ID, while rents also keep on stead steadily rising faster than income. Also, the quality of a lot of houses is poor. Damp houses with poor insulation have severe impacts on health, particularly for children. And a lot of people also live in houses that are simply too small for their families. And with education going online as well, this overcrowding became even more problematic. One of the biggest effects of COVID was that we suddenly had to deal with the homeless. Whilst the problem was largely ignored before, it now became important to shelter homeless people because of the public health risk. And this made clear that the existing shelter model is simply not working. Initiatives were taken to set up temporary shelters, house homeless people in hotels, and I hope that we can build on some of these emergency measures to move towards a housing based approach to homelessness. But I have seen that a lot of the temporary measures in the meanwhile have been cut back. In cities like Lisbon, entire neighborhoods turned into ghost towns because the tourists didn't come anymore during the pandemic. And this shows also how much housing was used to accommodate tourists instead of providing a home to people living, working, studying in the city. And it was cities that were at the forefront of responding to the housing related problems that we have seen during the pandemic. The housing crisis manifests itself in the first place in large cities. It's cities that set up temporary housing for the homeless and that organized in a coalition to set up rules for short term rentals such as Airbnb at EU level. And we've also seen that at national or regional level moratoria on evictions were put in place. And what the pandemic has made clear is that for any level of government, it's extremely difficult to have an impact on housing because the rules of the market right now prevail. Governments have stopped investing in social housing and have actively invited financial investors onto their housing market. More and more money flows into the housing market and less and less people can actually afford a home. Clearly, something isn't right. Housing is a human right guaranteed internationally at EU level and in a lot of countries in the Constitution. And this should be the starting point of our housing policy. 
to progressively realize the right to housing, we need to rein in the market forces and have the government take back control because houses are for people, not for profit. And it's clear what the starting point is, and I believe probably many participants to the Housing Forum might even agree, but where do we go from here? Well, since I am in the European Parliament, I started at the EU level. At the beginning in this, of this year, the Parliament adopted my report on decent and affordable housing for all, and this report puts housing as a human rights central. And I hope this can be the start of a shift of minds at the European level. The report also recognizes that the EU has been too absent when it comes to housing, whilst a lot of EU policies have a major impact on the development of housing prices. We know that the capital market union rules for banks, insurers, pension funds have worked as a fire accelerator for the financialization of the housing market. And we also see that the current fiscal rules are putting limits on how much governments can invest in housing. And with the European semester, we also have a powerful tool to steer economic and social policies, such as housing. But the Commission has been recommending for years to shrink the Dutch social housing sector. This needs to change. We need a coordinated approach to affordable and social housing at EU level. A concrete proposal I want to make today is that the ECOFIN ministers meet to discuss the surge in housing prices and rent, as they have also recently discussed the rising energy prices. Since the adoption of the report, some important steps have been taken though. In June, all member states adopted the Declaration on Homelessness. It is now firmly on the agenda of the EU with a common objective to end homelessness by 2030. But we are not there yet and we need to set ambitious goals when it comes to social justice. The Commission has also announced that it is working on rules for short-term rental platforms. And here we need strong data sharing obligations so that cities can implement and enforce their rules. Of course, the EU can only do so much and a lot of housing policy is not in our hands. Governments and cities need to put in place better rent regulation, urban planning favoring affordable housing, higher taxes on vacant buildings. I'm sorry, my light just turned off. <laughs> uh, stricter rules for transparency on home ownership. And uh, well, I guess I can go on and on for a while. The fight for decent and affordable housing for all is all but over. But I'm hopeful because people are letting their voices be heard all over Europe. In Berlin, the referendum on the largest landlord showed that people want that the current model of speculation and financialization needs to be changed. And in the Netherlands, ten thousands of people took to the, took to the streets in many cities to demand that houses are for people and not for profit. I will continue working to translate the struggle from the streets and the work of the many wonderful NGOs and civil society organizations and activists I've worked with in the last two years into policy. And I'm very much forward to hearing my other panelists what they are doing. Thank you so much. Many thanks to Kim to um, very inspire, inspiring words about the, um, the many issues we're facing, but also your proposal um, to the commission. I think that was great. And um, because I took a bit longer than uh, than expected, I think I will immediately pass on the ball to um, uh, to a totally different context, to Africa. We are going to uh, Mayor Sanya Wilson, Mayor of Koboko in Uganda. The microphone is all yours. Please, can you unmute? Really? Yes. Very good. Fantastic. OK, from Uganda, East and Central Africa. Now, Koboko, I am the mayor of Koboko Municipal. Koboko Municipal is at the extreme corner of South Sudan and Uganda and, and, and Congo. And, and from this perspective, I am coming against a background of a municipality that has 23,128 self-settled refugees. They live in 2,800 households. Now, these are refugees who are living with me, and I want to report Koboko Municipal is one of the hard hit during the COVID and, uh, you know, after the COVID, in as far as housing is concerned. 23,000, 2,800 households uh, of, of people living here, and, and the policy requires that they should, they should be social distance. Now, these refugees who are living with me, that we cannot send them to their homes because of our culture, that we cannot send them back to DRC because of our history, has, is, is a big challenge. 
And just like you gave Stefan in your initial introduction, Uganda is one, a, a, the system here is central local government. We have the challenge of central government and local government in, in Uganda. Now I am talking from the point of a local government. Majority of the policies on housing, just like my colleague has spoken here, is not in the hands of the mayor. We have to wait for them to say whatever they have. There is even no deliberate budget to enable us to have cheap cost housing for this. There's no deliberate budget for, for those agents who have come to our municipalities. So housing is a big challenge. And I think the COVID-19 pandemic has exposed Uganda. And I think the government of Uganda has to review their priorities in as far as support local governments are concerned. Housing should be now a need because we are having a lot of slums. And this is not only in Koboko, even in other urban areas. A lot of slums are developing because now with the new system of COVID-19, our approach as Uganda is, is what we call IEC. IEC is Information, Education and Communication. And we are moving to the approach of home-based approach. Now, your government is saying we should have a home-based approach to fighting COVID-19. But and, and in the SOPs, the standard operating procedures, we are supposed to have social distance in the homes. Now, if you divide 23,128 by, by 2,800, you can see per house, per house of how many people are there. So this SOP doesn't apply. Now, if government is coming with this new policy, because we have, we have the national housing policy, we have the national slum upgrading policy, we have the art policy, these policies need to all be reviewed and we need to factor in the challenges that COVID-19 has caused in other half housing is concerned in urban areas in Uganda. Because now, the, everything has to change. We need to undergo a lot of review, and I think we need a lot of support. Government needs to think about this, and there should be more and more focus to secondary cities. Secondary cities have been hit hard, and, and we are going to have challenges with how we do our planning, how we allocate our resources. There should be more focus on housing, because now we cannot take people to, to, to the health centers. Government is saying household. Government is saying for school learning, e-learning must be at home. Children in Uganda has the longest period of time where children are not going to school. Now the, the policy is, the standard operating procedure is saying we should have children learning at home. How can children learn at home when the, the, when the housing is not proper? Housing is not proper. There should be a deliberate effort by government, by the donors to look at the policy of housing and it must be decentralized down to government, I mean, to the lower, to the lower law of government. So I'm talking as the, the mayor here is that um, we, we have really, really live examples that uh, we need support in housing as far as governments are concerned. Now, housing in, in Africa, maybe I will say, it's, it is just housing is taken to be a luxury. The focus is food, but I think we need to shift. We need to shift the goalpost. Food should go together with housing. How do you give an alien food, and then he's, he has nowhere to keep the food. P children sleep inside, during the day, food is kept inside, and then at night, food is kept outside. So that, that causes a lot of problems for us. So now, really, I, I think this is an opportunity for us to get back on the drawing board, across the board, and we review all our housing policies. We need to streamline. We need to streamline all our policies to fit, to consider, to accommodate the challenges that COVID-19 has caused in many of the secondary cities and cities across the board. If we don't streamline, we are going to allocate resources according to the older, uh, or the, the, the older um, policies, but without factoring in the issue to do with COVID-19. So this really is what my, my, my take is. But the future is very bright. If we can put our heads together and we first have to start well. When we start well, we complete well. And I think the starting is we need to review all our policies, streamline with COVID-19 standard operating procedures that Uganda has set, and I think across the world. So Koboko, final is that Koboko Municipal, with all these number of aliens, like you see in the background, we have gotten support from the European Union. They gave us some funding. One thing that we did was to review our fiscal planning development plan, the fiscal planning development. We are now factoring in the need for us to plan part of our city into cheap housing. We have put around the 20, around six to 10 acres of land that we are designing it as a 
for cheap cost housing. Because of being in Congo, DRC Congo, I'll continue receiving refugees, economic uh, uh, migrants here. There is a need for me to have a deliberate move in my plan to make sure that we have a land that is designated for cheap cost housing. Probably I will now need the support from the European stimulus, that's the support from the European Union again. How do we make sure that we have cheap cost housing to support this initiative? Otherwise, Koboko, because of the border in Congo, I will continue getting more people who come here because it is the only it's the only municipality where people can get clear, I mean uh, where, where there are uh, isolation homes. People come and get every treatment here for COVID-19. And the government does not have a deliberate move to support aliens in my country. You must have a national ID. They use your national identification number, which is a big challenge. And only when they come here, they have no housing. They, they, they congest themselves. One person can, invade, can, can infect the whole family. So it's really a big challenge. And, and I think that's what I, I, I'll say. Probably I'll respond more if there are questions regarding this. I thank you very much, Stefan, and all my colleagues. Many thanks uh, to Mr. Sanya Wilson for uh, your very revealing um, um, insights from the COVID-19 crisis in, in, in your uh, jurisdiction. And um, I like the, the positive note at the end that you think, well, you know, we can actually do, we can use this as a chance now to, to come up with better policies than before. So this optimism I, 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 like, to, I like to believe in and, and, and like to see as a perhaps a a chance for us to, you know, to work more on, on solutions. Thanks a lot for that. Um, Doris Andoni, um, the floor is all yours now for the next eight minutes. Thank you. Thank you, Stefan. And uh, thank you for um, making available this spot for um, myself as a representative of uh, the United Nations Economic Commission for Europe Committee on Urban Development, Housing and Land Management. It's a long name. Uh, just an introduction of what uh, I represent here uh, and in the first part, so in this panel, I will be uh, all presenting uh, some of the outcomes of activities and uh, major documents that are produced by our committee and uh, to, to understand um, what, what we represent. Uh, UNEC is one of the five regional commissions of United Nations with 56 member states from Canada, North America, Europe, and Central Asia. Uh, our committee is uh, perhaps one of the oldest, uh, established in 1947 to review Europe after the war. Its mission is even more important in the modern area with the number of um, uh, events that have affected the development of the societies that we, uh, are, we have nowadays. Uh, not to forget, it was uh, mentioned also by Stefan, not to forget the transition of some countries from centrally planned into market economy that changed radically, among others, the way how housing was provided and the role of the state in that regard. The 2008 financial and economic crisis that hit tremendously the res re residential sector and left millions of people homeless. And the role of state was crucial to amortize and uh, the effects of the crisis. Climate changing whose effects are more devastating in some parts of our region due to also to high density of, of these regions and uh, which requires a serious shift in our planning patterns, uh, consumption habits and commitments also by governments to take immediate actions to prevent impact of disasters and enhance protection of the environment. And finally, COVID-19 pandemic that caused um, a health, social and economic crisis worldwide uh, with governments at all levels reacting to protect people's lives. Our, uh, one our, uh, of our major uh, policy documents is the Geneva UN Charter on Sustainable Housing, which was endorsed in 2015 by, my, by member states and highlights that, uh, among others, Often national policies and planning are inadequate to prevent and minimize damages from disasters and emergency situations. In all the cases that I already mentioned previously, um, it can be noted that governments have been unprepared to build resilience of the society as a whole. The explosion of the pandemic also demonstrated insufficient capacities of local, 
regional and national governments and international governance also for prevention and preparedness. While response was quite fast, fast although um, very often it was confusing. We still have to see the effectiveness of policies to enable fast and inclusive recovery from the multifaceted crisis, and in particular with regard to housing. Uh, last October, UNEC ministers responsible for housing met in Geneva at a high-level meeting on affordable, adequate and resilient housing in livable cities. From the minister's speech, it was deducted that despite wide regional differ differences between uh, our uh, member states, there is uh, the, uh, and broad development disparities also because we are we have the most uh, richest countries and also some of the less developed one um, across across our members. Uh, there are shared challenges that worsen the housing crisis, and these include, among others. The soaring housing and utility costs, including and in particular the energy. Housing supply shortages. Though this is not the same everywhere, for example, in Tirana, um, the housing supply has increased, though housing prices are still increasing. This is something that we don't explain. I mean, uh, <laughs> economists don't explain. Inadequate planning and financing tools and low institutional capacities to address these challenges. But I would also like, uh, I would also add uh, not only low capacity, but also lack of interest and commitment to solve the housing crisis by uh, national, regional, and local governments. In view of uh, COVID 19 crisis, a policy brief developed by UNECE during 2020 and published in 2021 as part of a UNDA project building urban economic resilience during and after COVID-19 show that all countries in the UNEC region have enacted measures to contain the pandemic. Governments' interventions were based on the universal regulations that dictated the policies stay at home, wash your hands, social distancing and work from home. It has been one of the most dramatic sceneries perhaps not seen since the end of the world, Second World War, with the most crowded cities and squares emptied, reminding the paintings of De Chirico. At the same time, it has been one of the most scenic situations when thinking of homeless people, of those that live in overcrowding conditions, those that, those that live in informal settlements and have no access to clean water and sanitation, and those threatened with evictions. And this was also mentioned by uh, Mayor uh, Sania. Some countries have provided quarantine centers, as also Kim mentioned, temporary shelters for homeless or uh, hotels made available for the same purpose. Uh, this, uh, however, these temporary and I would say also inadequate solutions are due to the fact that we didn't do much before the pandemic to ensure that everyone have access to an affordable and adequate home. During the lockdown, I would like to uh, also quote the special rapporteur on the right to adequate housing last year. Uh, that during the lockdown, housing became the frontline defense against the coronavirus and home was rarely been more of a life or death situation. Uh, policy measures to respond to the social and economic crisis that lockdown caused included mostly fiscal measures, including tax relief, wage subsidies and so on. These measures saved the jobs for many workers and many families from forced evictions they were crucial in a short run, but they are unsustainable in the long run. Moreover, suspension of rent and mortgage payment create an accumulated debt that can put households in more difficulties for their repayment. Uh, finally, the um, enhancement of digitalization made possible learning and working from home. This is a new normal that for sure will become a new normal for the future but not, which are the implications of digitalization and learning from uh, uh, learning and uh, working from home. 
First, digitalization goes along with increased risk for individual rights for privacy, freedom and security. So we need to make sure that digitalization does not compromise our privacy. Secondly, it can further segregate those that have no access to technologies. A report of UNECE for Southeast Europe demonstrated that distance learning deprived children of poor families from education during lockdown. Thirdly, finally, for the moment, working from home can save time and money for commuting, but it needs a home to make it possible. So in conclusions, I'll say that governments at all levels have taken the responsibility to respond to the multifaceted crisis caused by COVID-19 pandemic, including for housing. However, the pandemic showed that governments didn't build enough capacities before to respond adequately to the needs, in particular of spe special groups in dire housing situation. I would ask for um, um, the floor in the second panel where I would like to share some of my personal opinion on, um, on the future role of, uh, of governments, which is also um, my field of interest. So for the moment, thank you. Doris, uh, thank you very much. Um, lots of really succinct ideas. I just took some some notes here and um, um, really like your point about governments have not done enough before. That's why actually we are we're in, in, in you know in those 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 problems now. And I look forward to the um, solution focused discussion later. Thanks, Doris, again. Um, next speaker would be Jana Neverleinen. Uh, Jana, the floor is yours. Thank you, Stefan. There is uh, so much interesting to be some, uh, said already that it's uh, difficult to continue because um, there seems to be, of course, very same issues, uh, but um, also uh, uh, so much is said already. But uh, when we think the pandemic, the main of the main aim of the governments and public authorities everywhere have been to create policy measures targeted to e economic stabilization by offering income stabilization through the state aid or different social security systems and uh, temporary buffering of pandemic impacts on housing. Many governments have been thinking of what the appropriate policy mix is required to deal with household facing income or wealth constraints as a result of the pandemic and have created their own mixture. It seems the greater the mix, the more vulnerable are the social housing and social security systems. The broader the social and affordable housing stock and social security systems are, the better buffer they seem to keep in this acute crisis, providing resilience for society. This also means less policy measures needed to be activated. Therefore, the role of the public authorities and governments have been more important when the already existing housing and welfare systems have not offered enough buffer against this acute crisis. As said already before, there has been quite a mosaic of short-term housing policy responses depending on the housing system and combined with standard housing policies, just as affordable housing construction. Which policies have been successful depends pretty much on the housing and social security systems. It seems that everywhere public authorities and governments have had an important role to create policies targeted for the most vulnerable groups, like homeless people. These targeted policies have provided at least short-term relief when policies have brought rough sleepers into shelters and out of the shared accommodation. When these policies have offered more capacity for local authorities and for non-profit organizations to organize, more resources to help rough sleepers. Also, policies targeted at tenants, such as the extension of temporary rental contracts, rent freezes and eviction bans, 
which sometimes have been regulated and sometimes voluntary, have been very important. The capacity to take an action at this short notice, for example, with the measures targeted to homeless, seems to depend pretty much on what was done before the pandemic, how well cooperation networks were functioning, and what were the levels of mutual trust between public and voluntary sector actors, and how well they were working together. The COVID-19 pandemic have made the fragility of housing, healthcare and social security systems visible. Therefore, biggest failures have been made before the pandemic and the measures done during the pandemic have pretty much been reactions to the failures done beforehand. Neoliberal policies in the last decade have resulted in less and less investments in the in social and public housing in many European countries, giving support to financiation of housing and giving a major role for private investors instead of those who would use an apartment as their own home. As a result of social housing sector increasingly have become a domain of the lowest income households who often live segregated in social housing estates. These neoliberal policies have also led to the housing affordability crisis, which is already affecting not just the most vulnerable groups, but also to the middle income households, making home ownership or even housing that need, meet the needs of their users even further away dream for many. The housing affordability crisis has also led to a housing quality crisis, which will have long lasting effects much after the pandemic has been ended. Thank you, Jana. Um, really interesting ideas. I think we will come back to some of the ideas later because I think they're really um, fascinating, especially the pre-pandemic trust uh, commitments and the capacity building. And that was Doris was what Doris saying before. So interesting, very interesting, fascinating things. Um, but let's move on to our fifth speaker, Stepan Repka from the city of Prague. Very welcome to our panel. It's all yours. Yeah. Thank you for the invitation. Uh, and uh, I will be speaking uh, um, uh, very, uh, in a very practical way from a point of view of uh, city. Um, um, we have big affordability problem. Uh, actually, uh, in, in Prague, uh, you spent 12 average yearly wages to buy one flat um, compared to 10 in Munich uh, or Budapest or six in Berlin, Köln or Warsaw. So we are very, very, um, uh, we, we have uh, quite a big problem with affordability. And the pandemic uh, didn't change this. Uh, there were some expectations that the property prices uh, would drop, but this didn't happen. They, they still uh, rise. Uh, the rents um, dropped for a moment, but uh, uh, just for a moment, and uh, they are, they are uh, rising again. And uh, in general, what we as the city do about affordability, so we try to, actually, we still are trying to stop the privatization of municipal housing stock, which is a process that started in 1991. We had 200,000 flats. Nowadays, we have 30,000 flats, and the privatization is not yet banned. Uh, and uh, there are city boroughs that still Privatized, and this depends on on the on the policy of of, of the of the local governments. Um, uh, we try to do the best with the land we have. So uh, we we create um, city developer, and uh, we prepare the land with. Uh, uh, we we focus more on like preparing the land with infrastructure. Uh, to to be able uh, to to build in future, uh, and uh, 
we are trying to do our best with the housing stock we have. So we are trying to um, allocate the housing stock based on the vulnerability and need of the household, not merit. Uh, we are trying to build um, kind of coordinated entry system for ending homelessness, uh, but uh, we are still lacking housing. And uh, uh, for, 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 for the question, what um, uh, what we learned uh, during the pandemic. So um, we are example of one of the um, uh, V4 uh, uh, cities uh, that actually have different government than center government. And there, there has been a big conflict between the governments. And uh, uh, so, so I'm going to be actually critical uh, about the national government because, uh, uh, but it's not only the current or previous national government, but it's government housing policy in general. Um, it is our legacy of post-socialism, I guess, uh, that uh, uh, we still believe in rights to buy. Uh, we uh, still believe that there is something as well-working housing market and uh, any measures towards uh, housing affordability that are applied elsewhere, such as rent regulation, uh, uh, tax uh, for cooling down uh, the demand, um, are not uh, viable, like politically wise, to, to be passed, passed through. It's like no-go zone. So there is uh, this um, uh, uh, there is this discourse that uh, we have to build more flats because um, uh, then uh, the housing will be solved. Uh, we hope that more flats will be built. We have new national government and uh, it will make uh, the construction more fe flexible and it will start more flats. But, uh, uh, but uh, we are um, uh, really uh, not sure where those flats will go. And uh, uh, we don't see uh, huge construction capacity in the public sector, not to talk about finance. Uh, what we did in response to COVID uh, uh, as a city, um, so we, will, uh, we were able as other European uh, and, uh, and American cities, uh, we are able to mobilize some hotel rooms for homeless people uh, whose shelters weren't fit uh, for uh, for uh, accommodation uh, in the in the pandemic, and with those hotel places, uh, we actually evaluated that the uh, the spread of, of COVID was lower uh, than uh, between the general population. We still keep some of the hotels and. Uh, uh, we uh, are trying to find solution to end the homelessness of at least those people we we had uh, on those hotels with different means. That's first. Uh, we second. We issue the call to buy some hotels uh, because we thought that would be the situation on the market. We have not been successful yet because. Uh, uh, there is there is no um, the the supply is not there yet. Um, so we hope it might come in the future, uh, or we also uh, want to acquire office buildings and and rebuild them uh, towards flats. And uh, uh, we are also starting a municipal rental agency, which is master leasing scheme guaranteed by the city. And uh, there seems uh, to be a lot of interest in this. Uh, it's not in our capacity to um, drop the Airbnb flats from the market because there are like 12,000 flats that were used for Airbnb uh, in, in Prague. Uh, our uh, goal is to have 500 flats in a few years, but we are building step by step. And uh, what are the biggest gaps or, or failures? Uh, 
So uh, I think really the biggest gap is still the recognition that uh, housing can be regulated, that there is such thing as a national housing policy that can be put in place uh, to actually influence the housing situation of, of the inhabitants. I think uh, there is uh, not yet consensus uh, on, on this, not only uh, between the politicians, but, uh, but within the public uh, either. Thank you. Thank you very much, Stepan. Um, again, fascinating insights from Prague. 12,000 flats for Airbnb, that's a, that's a lot. I went to Prague this year and um, I understand, you know, why why um, tourists are coming and there will be big question again over the competition between residents and and and, and tourists in, in the post-pandemic times in those cities like Prague, Barcelona and, and others. Thanks again. Um, we already have some interesting questions from the audience. Yes, I encourage you to ask questions because I will give pass them on right away then to the panel after the next uh, and last uh, speaker. And that is uh, Tobia, Tobia Sebi, Councillor for Heritage and Housing Policies for the City of Rome. Uh, Tobia, the microphone is yours. Thank you very much. I hope you can hear me. And uh, basically, I agree, it's very difficult to talk after such a uh, long list of interventions and many inputs. Uh, I'm actually dealing with this issue directly. Uh, just, uh, I mean, uh, I mean, I've been dealing with these issues just for a few days because we were elected uh, just two weeks ago. So this is a new capacity for me. It's the first intervention, first intervention, international intervention I do as a city commissioner for housing and I would say public asset, but I'm not sure whether the translation is correct, more than, than heritage, which is more like a cultural thing. So basically I uh, will try to uh, mix, let's say, the new inputs I've been actually getting in the past few days with my previous uh, experience as a researcher on urban issues at the Italian Institute for International Political Studies, which was my capacity while the pandemic actually spread. So I would like to say just four things, and maybe some of them are repeated, but I think it's important to get a complex, uh, uh, a whole um, speech about this issue. So the first thing is that as you mentioned, I mean, I would say all the interventions actually underlined, uh, the pandemic was also a paradox in terms of housing and the housing paradigms. What I'm saying is that, of course, we had a completely split situation with a big part of the population, was, which was actually, of course, forced to stay home, but it was pleasant to spend more time with families and, of course, I mean, uh, also, you know, get the opportunity to learn a new way of working, smart working, uh, you know, distance and, of course, learning from distance and many other things. But then, of course, we know that there was another bigger part of the population also in Europe, not only in other countries or in, let's say, developing countries, uh, which uh, faced a lot of problems related to the housing conditions. And they were all mentioned, loneliness, we said, and of course, the difficult to you know, find a balance between work and life. And of course, dimensions in many houses, also in Europe, I mean, it's very difficult to get separation between you know, children and parents and different functions. And of course, the internet connection. There was a research uh, uh, taken, uh, make, made by, the community of Santa Gide, which is an NGO very famous in Rome and not only in Rome, which actually demonstrated that 61% of children in Rome during the first lockdown, so I'm talking about spring 2020, were not able to connect not even once to uh, digital devices connected to schools. So this was the pandemic paradox, and this was the first uh, point I would like to mention. We understood that actually housing was at the core of a huge uh, rising inequality within our societies, within our cities, and this was one of the symbols and this was one of the uh, witnesses of this rising inequality. Then how did states and institutions react to this huge problem? Well, of course, I mean, there were many interventions. 
uh, usually states, and this was the case of Italy, massively intervened to protect people and, of course, to limit the social and economic consequences of the crisis, many ways. In terms of housing, uh, the main measures adopted, at least in Italy, to respond to the COVID-19 pandemic were uh, the blocking of the evictions on one hand and rent allowances. So basically, this is interesting because uh, in the balance between the interests of the landlords and those of the renters, the latter were more protected. And uh, of course, because they were supposed to generally suffer more the consequences of the crisis. Now, what is happening today is that we have uh, between five and six and seven evictions a day in Rome, since, of course, I mean, the pandemic is hopefully in a decreasing phase. And so those measures are progressively phased out. So uh, we need to uh, rethink uh, of, a, <laughs> of a model of intervention in this new phase. And just to give you a figure, in Rome, talking about the uh, social housing, so people in different contexts living within the framework of social housing, we're talking about around 100,000 apartments, which means if we, th if we count about three people and apartments, around 300,000 people living in a protected way, which means around 10% of our populations. And I'm talking about Italy, capital of state within the you know g7 and whatever you know so basically i would say a, a very developed country in a very developed um, society so basically we and this is the third point we understand now after the most severe severe phase of the pandemic and after the decreasing phase of the pandemic which means also the decrease of the measures against the social and economic consequences that we need to find and develop a new model, a new paradigm, uh, also regarding housing policies, because we need to uh, mix and we need to take into account different uh, needs. Uh, of course, we have the need to, have to, 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 to build and to have more comfortable and shared homes, uh, where the community is more united instead of you know, many people living alone within the first lockdown and within the pandemic. But also we understand that we need to have space for work and live. Uh, we need to have, as I said, more, uh, you know, sharing. We need to have more sustainable buildings with less impact on the environment. And of course, uh, we need to uh, include all these needs within a general framework of uh, you know, social and economic objectives, because we also need in Europe, as everywhere in the world, to restart our economies. So to conclude, and this is the fourth point, we need to understand what to do now. There are several uh, things we are trying to do in Rome and in Italy in general, and I think these are not examples, but I mean, I, these are inputs for our discussions. So first of all, we understood that uh, if we want to uh, have a housing which is aimed to, you know, building uh, more sustainable cities, then we need to mix different instruments, different tools. We need to have social and private housing. We need to sustain private investment as well as uh, increasing public investment. And of course, I mean, we need to do this uh, in the framework of, you know, uh, housing for people. Many of you already said that, of course, housing is a human right. We remember the Sustainable Development Agenda. We remember the different declarations. We, need, we know about the European uh, New Bauhaus and Leipzig Charter. Uh, we need to invest more. This is the issue in the maintenance of houses. And, of course, we need within this maintenance, we need to um, change them also to adapt them to the new needs of people. I'm thinking, for example, of the uh, a very huge issue we have here in Rome with big houses, big social housing houses, apartments, which were designed in the 60s or in the 70s when the families had, you know, three or four children. And now we need to restore them, but also to uh, divide them because we have many, many families which are one person, two people. And of course, they need, they had different needs. And in this respect, we have a very, very 
positive instruments coming from the national investment, but also from the EU investment, the, 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 the European investment, which is the what we call the bonus 110. I don't have time to explain it, but the issue is that we have a very, very big public investment on the retrofitting of the uh, private homes. And also we are trying to make it on the uh, social housing in the public homes to make them more and energetic, energy efficient, and of course, also more healthy for people. And finally, as I said, and I'm really concluding, all these interventions are also aimed, not only, as I said, to regenerate our cities and to um, improve people's life, but also to restart our economies. This is the issue in the city of Rome, which had a big crisis, big economic, big economic crisis in the past years. But this is also a general sustainable way to boost economic growth. And of course, this is the reason why public authorities, and this is the case of what we will try to do in our capacity here at the municipality of Rome, shall sustain such activities, such attitudes via tax credits, other incentives in order to help people to renovate their homes and of course to live in a better condition. Thank you very much. Many thanks um, to BSAB for your excellent uh, points. I also like the very practical, um, really practical solutions at the end, like the bonus 110 uh, program and so on. So we're moving into solutions now. And um, I encourage um, our audience to, to ask questions in the chat box. We already have two interesting questions here, which I will pass on immediately to our speakers. Uh, Jury from Habitat for Humanity um, ask Kim a question. Kim, your great report, you know, that's the European Parliament report, I think from earlier this year, I think it was, calls on the Commission to urgently develop an integrated EU level strategy for social, public, non-segregated and affordable housing, creating an enabling framework for national, regional and local authorities to ensure the provision of safe, healthy, accessible and affordable quality housing for all. This is most welcome. Could you comment on what we should do together to achieve this, please? Kim. Thank you very much. And that's a, that's a big question. Um, but I think um, the first step to take is to acknowledge the fact that we are not going to solve the housing crisis and housing affordability crisis, nor the uh, housing quality crisis um, by ignoring um, different levels of government. So for the longest time we've heard uh, the European Union has no competences on housing, so we can't do anything about the housing crisis. And uh, in the report that, um, that I wrote, um, we made it very clear um, that we do have an impact on uh, the European housing market, specifically on the market aspect. And that there is something we really have to, to change our way of treating the way, the, the influence we have. Like um, I've said before that, um, you know, we, we do have European housing policies. We're just not aware of them. Um, and we have to be aware of them and, you know, be very specific in the way we address housing from a European level. And next to that, I think it is very important that, you know, there are better and uh, better conversations and that there is better collaboration between the different levels um, to make sure that what is needed to combat the housing crisis is done at the right level. Um, that is what we what we have to do. That's what we're aiming for as well, um, because, you know, local levels are most aware of what their citizens needs because they are the ones that have, you know, the closest contact with them. And I think having those two together, so, you know, the, the right levels taking their responsibilities, but also the right levels, you know, doing what they need to do to solve the housing crisis, that's how we can get a truly integrated approach. Thank you, Kim, for this answer to a very big and important question a jury uh, just raised. And um, moving now from the EU level down to the lower level uh, with another question that, that I think is quite fascinating. That question comes from Katarzyna from Habitat Poland, Stepan. So this is for Stepan from, from uh, Prague. Stepan, we have heard that social rental agency was established in Prague by the local authorities. Could you please indicate how, how this model is organized and who can rent a flat from the agency? 
Stepan, would you be able to respond to this question? Yes. Thank you for that question. Uh, just uh, let me quickly comment uh, uh, following uh, Kim. Uh, I think uh, it's perfect uh, that actually there are people in the European Parliament that uh, that um, uh, start the uh, discussions and promote uh, right to housing. Because uh, what we see uh, uh, in uh, what what uh, we see in the Czech Republic is that actually. Um, European regulations on uh, state aid and service of general economic interest and all this are actually affecting public investment in public housing. Uh, and uh, we need to get those things uh, uh, well uh, to be able to influence the, uh, the government programs and to upscale. So I think uh, it's, it's great that uh, there is European initiative and and uh, there, there is constant pressure. Um, uh, concerning uh, our uh, social rental agency, it's really small. So, uh, like, uh, th there, there was Lisbon that, uh, that that was issuing a big call. There are other cities that uh, had master leased uh, for for ages. So it's nothing new. But uh, so uh, it's uh, uh, Prague uh, has a city firm which is provider of. Uh, social services, but also um, also runs shelters and uh, and uh, uh, different facilities. And this firm is actually issuing a call uh, for uh, for um, rental offers. And uh, uh, so it's a basic subletting scheme with a guarantee uh, from the city, uh, guarantee to risk uh, to um, that, that the flat would be occupied. And currently we have 15 flats, so it's really, really small. But it's teaching us actually uh, that uh, what we started doing uh, with, the, with the city housing stock, uh, which is the housing first model, and uh, we have more than 150 uh, housing first flats uh, with, with this uh, target group in two years now in Prague. Um, uh, we see that it's also possible to uh, do similar things with the with the private flats. So we guarantee uh, there there's a guaranteed income uh, to to the owner, and uh, we are subletting and uh, selecting the tenants. So the tenants are actually coming from our coordinated entry. It's uh, it is us who who uh, is uh, uh, selecting. Uh, the tenant and providing support. Mm -hmm. Thanks a lot for that. Um, Laura Palenchikova uh, made, made a comment here, which, which refers to, to the, this last point. She said the housing agency model, the social use of private owner occupied housing is a good model in the new member states, but it does not seem to work in the longer term without stable public investment hopefully supported by the EU. And our research in hung hung Hungary shows that without substantial public investment in housing, provided resources remain in the social sector, housing affordability could not be managed. So we have to think long term. So more a comment from, from her side. I saw that uh, Josef Hegedusch and Besim Nebiu, I think there are questions from you. Is it correct? Um, uh, should we give the, uh, I just see a note here from you, Josef and von Besim, but I have no question here. I'm not sure how we solve this one, but but we um, could continue with focusing on on the solutions. Um, and um, some of your present, some of our presenters already talked about some some great ideas. So I invite you, whoever wants to say something about what would be a new idea, what would be an agenda item that that needs to put on the list now of um, of governments of of societies uh, here in Europe to solve housing problems. I, I guess I want you to come forward with your ideas. I'm not uh, giving the microphone to anyone, but just to invite, um, you know, innovative ideas. So maybe I'm not sure Doris, uh, Jana, um, Tobia already work, work quite. So, 
So I, yeah, I, I can add one thing. I, I'm not sure where I, I, I'm. I'm. I'm playing the ice breaking role, let's say. So I'm Please. not sure whether this is useful or not. But I'm useful at least as an icebreaker in this case. Uh, a big issue uh, I we, we we face here in Rome, and I wonder whether this is an issue also for other colleagues around the around Europe, around the world, uh, in Africa, and other contexts, is that we uh, one of the pillars of our let's say, recovery and resilience strategy, to use the formal uh, name we, we gave to the, to, the, to, the, to the future in Europe, uh, is, of course, this digitalization. In my personal experience, it's a recent one, as I said before, I'm actually finding out that this is a huge challenge also in this field. Uh, we need to invest a lot of money in terms of uh, knowing the public assets, knowing them better, uh, knowing private assets as well, and then, of course, possibly to manage them uh, in the direction, of course, of energy efficiency and, you know, uh, shared energy and, you know, shared mobility. There are many possible mm, less and more uh, futuristic uh, projects we can imagine. But uh, in my case, I would say the one of the biggest challenge we need to um, to implement and also uh, one of the greatest opportunity the uh, you know European funds and in general the you know public funds uh, allow us to actually implement is that of digitalization uh, that of modernization of our archives and our, of our you know um, of our knowledge I would say in general and this is something I think uh, you know, getting more data is something which is often mentioned in the, you know, international conferences, but then to make it happen, to make it get on the field, it's uh, much more difficult and I think much more important. Yes, yeah, good, good point, Tobia. I, I just feel reminded of my work with Herb Act and we're working with 10 cities across Europe on, on very practical solutions to urban problems. And um, a number of cities have uh, embarked on on tree planting and 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 the whole data issue. What you say, it's very really important because we often don't even know, you know, where are the trees, um, and and we don't have um, any any reference, any 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 digital or, or even even any any plan where you know. And 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 so, how can we make public investment? How can you plan good pro programs if you lack the data? So I can definitely see your point. Thank you for that um, ice breaking comment. Who else wants to be innovative and think about, you know, the post-pandemic um, agendas? <clears throat> it's me. <laughs> Hello. Yes, yes, Can please, Doris. Yes, please. Yeah, I had some problems because I was interrupted. By no problem. Um, and uh, perhaps mine is not an uh, innovative idea, but I, I would like to uh, go back to what I mentioned uh, in the beginning about the role of the public sector in, in housing, because it's a long lasting disputes on too little or too much government in housing. And um, I think that it's a conventionary force the last three decades that housing is an individual problem that should be solved by people themselves with the help of the private sector, with little intervention from governments for those that are uh, for the, the poorest and uh, the most vulnerable ones. And while well, the pandemic showed that um, a, a, or reinforced uh, the, um, the public interest in housing, uh, coming myself, coming from a highly centralized system, I am a great believer in the powers of capitalism and democracy and in the capacities of the private sector to distribute quality and efficiency. But I also believe that the private sector cannot distribute equity goals, which is a duty of the public sector. Even the most idealistic markets that Margaret Thatcher would um, claim uh, 40 years uh, ago, that every man and woman a capitalist, to be a capitalist, is as, ideal, uh, is as idealistic as the ideology, communist ideology of everyone equal. The theory of invisible hand of Adam Smith does not work in a monopolized and or not transparent housing markets. If the market is dominated by few investors, these investors compete with themselves, establish prices, and if their finance come from dubious unverifiable sources, 
like money laundering, they don't care if the house will remain empty and unsold. And this I come to the um, what um, has been emphasized by the previous uh, special rapporteur on the right to adequate housing uh, about the problem of, of financialization of the residential sector due to speculations and money laundering practices. And, but to find this phenomenon, it needs a great commitment of all parties and national and international to also local governments, which are very much important in the um, way how housing and real estate market is developed. So are they ready to do this right now? So it is not only the pandemic that calls for a new social contract, it's the way how economy and societies are developing with concentrating the powers of decisions and the richness in less than 5% of the global population, which is disappearing the middle class that previously was the support of the society with its intellectual and scientific contribution. This middle class now has become a contingent of uh, housing policies. So number of those that need uh, that cannot access private market is increased because of this big white and uh, big gap between uh, this uh, two polarized uh, society. So um, the, I think that we have uh, to discuss much more on this very uh, uh, critical topic, which is not very much um, uh, liked by, by those that, that put regulations and rule. So there is a serious need to re-examine the policies for opening markets to small and medium enterprises, for prohibiting financing housing developments from unverifiable sources, and for revising the redistributive policies, not as charity means, but as a right of those who were expulsed from the market. So uh, finally, I'd like also to uh, emphasize that um, housing cannot stand alone in fighting for better quality of life. And we also cannot pretend that only through housing policies to fight against this financialization of the housing market. It needs um, wide engagement of all the society, even the, the um, non-governmental um, stakeholders need to um, to be uh, enforced and uh, influence these policies. So adequate housing is a process of individual achievement that need to be supported with the right policies, inclusive urban planning and effective financial instrument. It needs, uh, uh, and what I all also emphasize is that it needs uh, horizontal cooperation between different policies, education, uh, job training, uh, education for new uh, market demand, uh, health policies, um, urban planning, as well as vertical coordination from national to regional and local governments. Um, and the, the pandemic has deepened the inequalities and threatened the human rights. And I think that uh, so 73 years after the signatory of the uh, Universal Declaration of Human Rights, there is a need to revise and strengthen human rights in regard to also right to housing and uh, of a new social and in the new social, economic and technological developments. So, many, yeah, thank yeah. you very much. Many thanks, Doris, for a very programmatic uh, contribution. Thanks a lot. I suggest because we only have uh, four minutes left to have uh, some rapid, rapid fire questions here. And um, first one comes from uh, Asia. She asks, do you have a lot of unoccupied dwellings, empty dwellings in your municipality? And if yes, do you intend to try to use them as part of social housing? So this is, I guess, for those of you who who um, um, are mayors or work with the municipality. Um, any unoccupied housing and, and any ideas what you could influence there? Or is this not an issue? I guess for Rome or for Prague <laughs> or for also for, um, you know, Kokobo in Uganda? Very short answer. Yes, it's a huge issue. <laughs> mm -hmm. Any plans? Well, it, that, this is a very complicated situation because, of course, we have uh, many people which are uh, basically in need. So, of course, it's it's you cannot just 
you know, uh, tackle the problem as a legal one. On the contrary, you have a crime problem, which is another uh, completely another another phase. And of course, I mean, we need to fight against the criminal organization of the occupation, which is something, we, of course, uh, which is a, a violation, first of all, of the legal rights of those who are more fragile. So, of course, we it's, it's we, we need to fight against this kind of organization. And then, of course, we need to find solutions for those who simply cannot afford anymore uh, to, no, not afford anymore, who, who still cannot afford to get a house, to get a, you know, to get a ceiling on the head, but of course, they are behaving in an illegal, illegal way. Mm -hmm. Thank, thank you, uh, Stepan. In Prague, do you have unoccup unoccupied housing, and is this an issue or not so much? Oh yes, uh, but uh, uh, well, there are two things. So uh, talking about unoccupied uh, public housing. Uh, so we are trying to get rid of this and uh, renovate what we can. Uh, uh, there are still tens of thousands uh, unoccupied flats uh, uh, in, in, in the country uh, belonging to public authorities. Uh, so we are actually trying to lobby in, uh, a government plan and government finance to get these, uh, these flats to housing market or uh, to uh, municipal housing stock. Uh, regarding unoccupied flats in general, um, uh, like investment flats or with the long, uh, sh short term rentals and so on. Um, as I said, uh, in my country, unfortunately, it's such a, um, such a no go issue that uh, uh, our gov uh, city government coalition, there was a proposal. Uh, just to find out how many flats, uh, unoccupied flats, there could be right. with the use of like electricity company, uh, and uh, uh, this this was dismissed uh, by uh, like conservative party uh, because uh, it was seen as neo Marxism. Right. I mean, we 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 actually don't have uh, don't even have this kind of debate, and uh, right. uh, it's uh, the the political debate is really very different in in our post socialist country. Right. Right. Thank you. So, so highlighting the importance of data, but also the debates, who can be very polarizing, are just some of those those issues we have to tackle. Unfortunately, guys, unfortunately, we're coming to an end. I was asked to return. Um, to our uh, uh, master of ceremony at uh, 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 2.33, so we have only one minute left. So many thanks to um, all our speakers today. It was great to hear you, and I hope that uh, you will uh, stay with us for the next couple of days for this great uh, uh, event. But also thank you to the audience for your questions, for your attention, and hopefully um, you will be able to join uh, much wanted the debates and into the networking functions here, if you're around here in Brussels, for example. So thanks a lot. Um, it was uh, great to to moderate the session. I, I wrote a lot of inf interesting things down here. And um, yes, hope to see you again and, and stay tuned um, with this great event. Yeah, I return the microphone now to our master of ceremony, and that is Mr. Dean Nelson. Bye bye, everyone. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye. Thank, thank you, Stefan, and to all the panelists for a fascinating session and for getting us off to a flying start to the urgent work ahead. How do we bring local and central governments together to address the growing housing need? How do we give local authorities the power to deal with local housing needs? How do we reconcile ideology rights to buy, for example, when social housing need is rising? And how can we maximise the housing stock available when Airbnb and short lets attract investors? Do we need an ECOFIN meeting, an EU level practical action? Fabulous start. We're going to take a break now for coffee and for networking. It's your time. Can I remind you that you can, if you wish, message other participants in the forum or schedule one to one meetings via the platform or explore the work of our sponsors, co organizers, and exhibitors via the Expo tab on the Deal Room platform? Can I also remind you that the two day really 
residential energy efficiency for low income households conference is running in parallel with this Europe housing forum from 2.15 today and that you can join its sessions by clicking on all events on the left hand column in the deal room lobby. We'll see you back here at 3 p.m. for our first roundtable in formal settlements informal settlement upgrading post COVID-19 moving from upgrading to revitalization and sustainability. See you at 3 p.m.